everyone it's good to see everyone out this evening thank you for joining bible classes here tonight we're going to sing 755 when the roll is called up yonder first and third verses and then randall will teach us here this evening when the trumpet of the lord shall sound and time shall be no Thank you for being here this evening. We're glad to have you with us. And um, we will be picking up where we left off last week. And that's um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, beginning in verse 13. I've gotten a, just a little bit behind, and um, I guess I had more notes on chapter 4 than I thought I would have, so I need to finish that up. We'll move into chapter 5 um, after we finish chapter 4. And I thought, well, I'll catch up on chapter 5. There's all those little short verses at the end of chapter 5, and I'll be able to go right through. I got more notes on chapter 5 than any other chapter I've got to. <laughs> so, so we probably will not, well, I'm certain we won't finish with chapter 5. But uh, next week we'll finish chapter 5, go into 2 Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 1, I'll try to pick up the pace there. I do want to spend some time in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3, I should be able to close it out rather quickly because um, Paul um, goes back over some things in chapter 3 that he had um, discussed in, in his first letter. But let's go ahead and get started in tonight's class, and we'll read um, starting in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive... Oh, I've got to turn this little thing. Sorry, excuse me. that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So in this last section of chapter 4, Paul returns to teach him more about the second coming of Jesus, to Perusa, if you will. And um, the King James Version says, Paul did not want the Thessalonians um, to be ignorant. Um, in this um, Eng, uh, English um, standard version uses the word uninformed and 
and that's probably a better word to use here. The Thessalonians lacked information about the second coming, and Paul is, is planning to supply them with some much-needed teachings regarding the general resurrection on the day of judgment. Specifically, Paul is wanting to help them understand about those who are asleep. And of course, we know and understand that when Paul mentions those that are asleep, he's talking about those that have died. It's, it's just a way of saying those that have already died. So what was their misunderstanding about those who were asleep? We know that... Pardon? That they will miss the coming of the Lord. That they would miss it? You know, that death occurs. I mean, death continues. Shirley and I were in Rome um, a few years ago, and we went to a catacomb, and... and and it was the strangest thing that all these little skulls from, from ages and ages ago of, um, I guess, um, monks that, that were on the wall there. And, and, you know, and it was just sort of an eerie thing to see all that over time and that was take, taking place. You know, we may not know when death will occur, but we know it will happen. In the time between Paul's departure from Thessalonica just a few months earlier until the writing of this letter, undoubtedly, and apparently some of the Christians in Thessalonica had died um, for one reason or another. So these young Christians were grieving about the loss of a loved one and also grieving about the thought that their loved one would miss the, the return of Jesus. Now, the Thessalonians had correctly understood that Jesus would return. They, they did understand that. And they understood it would be a great and glorious time when he did return. But they had mistakenly understood that Jesus would be, be returning immediately or very, very soon before any of them died. They thought it was going to happen just any moment. And it could have happened any moment, but as we know, it hadn't because we're here, and that was 2,000 years ago. But now Paul had left, Jesus had not returned, and some of their beloved brethren were dying. And these um, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ may have suffered persecution. Um, they probably sacrificed a lot for the Lord because when they became Christians, it, it's, it was worse in those days at that time in those places than it is here. Um, they could have been shunned by family members. They could have been shunned by business partners, shunned in the marketplace. Um, it, they probably sacrificed a lot. And those left living did not want those who had passed on to miss Jesus' return. Does Paul tell them not to grieve? No, he never tells them not to grieve. Do you remember a time when Jesus grieved over the death of a loved one, a, a good friend? Lazarus. And um, Paul does tell the Thessalonian Christians not to grieve as others do who have no hope. Um, the others to which Paul is referencing are the unbelievers or outsiders mentioned in verse 12. For they have no hope of being freed from sin and no hope of eternal life. But for the Christian who passes from this life, we can grieve their death, and we do grieve death, but we need not grieve that there is no hope for the Christian. Verse 14, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, your translation may have the word if instead of since, but since is the proper understanding Paul had no doubt that Jesus died and was raised from the dead. It's not a, well, if he did, it's since he did. And because Paul believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus, he also believed in the resurrection of Christians who were asleep or who had passed from this life. In his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, 22, and 23, Paul writes of the resurrection, 
For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, and then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Jesus was the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. There were others that had been raised back to life, but they died again. Um, but Jesus did not. And, um, and when he comes again, those in Christ will rise to meet him in the air, never to die again. I want to spend just a little time discussing the idea of a rapture. Um, those who believe in the rapture sometimes use verse 14 to support their view. The rapture, as it's called, has crept into our culture. I don't think it's quite as big a thing as it was maybe eight, ten years ago. There were all kinds of movies and books and things like that about the rapture. And, um, but, but still, it's still in our culture today. The end of verse 14 says, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So the question is, which direction is God bringing with him those who have fallen asleep? Will the dead in Christ be coming from heaven with Jesus to the earth, or will they rise from the earth and go to heaven with Jesus? Some hold to the idea that Christians will return to the earth with Jesus and say that's the way it has to happen. Otherwise, those asleep in Jesus will miss the return of Jesus. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes that all those who belong to Christ will be made alive at the second coming. That is not, however, the end of the second coming. How does the end come? When Jesus delivers his kingdom, the church, those who are in the body of Christ to God the Father, the return of Jesus is not over until we're brought back into heaven with him. And when will the dead in Christ be made alive? At his coming. No one who has died or will die before the Lord returns they will not be made alive prior to his second coming in order to come back to earth with him. There's some scholars that say this points to resurrected Christians on the last great day going up to heaven and with Jesus not coming down to earth with him. But I also will say that there are those scholars and some that I highly respect who are of the opinion that those who are dead in Christ will return with him. And, um, and if you want to read more on that, <laughs> you might look at Wayne Jackson. How he's got some interesting thoughts about, about the resurrection. Um, but there is so much that we do not know about the end of time, but God has provided us with everything that we need to know, and I think we can agree about that. But closing out 1 Thessalonians 4.14, Paul is beginning to make a contrast between the dead in Christ being resurrected and delivered to heaven and Christians in Thessalonica who were still alive and waiting for Jesus' return. It is not a contrast in these verses of non-believers and believers who are still alive. Um, you know, those that, that want to believe in the rapture think that um, the saved, some of the saved will be taken up and those that are not saved will be left behind. That's not what Paul's talking about here. And um, in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, Paul then addresses those who will be alive when the Lord returns. Paul is assuring the Thessalonian Christians that if they were still alive when Jesus returned, they would not, be go they would not go before the dead in Christ. He's telling them that there will be no advantage for the Christians still living versus those who had preceded them in death. Actually, in this verse, Paul says, we who are alive and we who are left until the coming of the Lord. 
Is um, Paul saying he expected to be alive when Jesus returned? No, and elsewhere, you know, um, you know, Paul had no idea when Jesus planned to return. And some of his other letters, he included himself as part of the group that will be raised with the dead. On this idea of Christians who had died participating in the second coming, Paul makes himself even clearer in verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection of beloved deceased Christians will occur immediately when the Lord descends from heaven. So what are some of the signals associated with the second coming? Yeah, all those will happen. Too late to do anything, but that will happen. <laughs> You'll know. Everybody on earth is going to know it. Sometimes I think, how is people on the other side of the globe going to understand, or how am I on the other side of the globe going to understand? I don't leave that to God. <laughs> you know, that's one of those things I don't have to worry about. Even from an engineering perspective, I don't have to worry about how that works. Um, this shout or word of command, do you recall a similar occasion where someone sh shouted out the dead? Natalie, who was that? Lazarus shouted out of the dead. Um, and Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come forth. You know, the, the Alan Webster mentioned last week, I think it was him that was talking about when Jesus shouted for the dead to come forth, you know, glad he called him by name, otherwise everybody would have come out of their grave. That, that's not so much my question. I'm wondering, if I'm Lazarus and I'm dead and I hear Jesus calling my name to come forth, what did that feel like? You know, I, again, I don't know, but one day we're all going to know because he's going to call us all out and we'll know exactly how Lazarus felt. But with the voice of the archangel, Matthew 24, 31, provides some insight in that angels will be used to gather the elect, or Christians, for delivering the heaven and the God. The identity of this archangel isn't known, but it could be Michael, as he's mentioned as, as being an archangel. Uh, Matt sang the song tonight, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, that starts with the words, When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Thank you for leading that. In 1 Corinthians um, 15, 52, and I don't think I got this verse on the screen, but Paul, in writing to the Corinthian Christians, says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. In this passage, Paul has only addressed the resurrection of believers, those who are in Christ. Not mentioned here, but spoken of elsewhere by Jesus and by Paul, the unrighteous will also be resurrected. The main point Paul is making here to the Thessalonians is that God is not going to neglect their loved ones who had died. They would be the first ones raised with Jesus. And surely I should probably, yes. Yeah. In the next chapter, uh, next, you know, chapter 2, it talks about coming with his angels and flaming fire. Taking vengeance on those who do no good. Are we going to be caught up there with the Lord and his angels and flaming fire? Wow, won't that be something to see? Well, that'll be something to see. Yeah, we'll be caught up. I don't think we'll be here when the fire comes, but... <laughs> Sorry, you got me off on the Johnny Cash. <laughs> Shirley, I probably should have given you a heads up on this, but I'm going to tell a Shirley story. I think it's a great story. I loved it. And do I? <laughs> yeah. When we lived in Columbia, the church um, bought some land to build a new facility, much like Walter Hill has, has done here and. And um, that was some 20 years ago. And as the case with most building projects, you always need to raise funds to build a facility. 
Shirley had the idea of setting aside some of this land for a church cemetery. And like, like you see in a lot of older churches, you know, around the country. Uh, personally, I think it's right peaceful to have a cemetery beside a church building. And, and Shirley added that if a cemetery was placed next to the building when the Lord returned, we could see who was rising first. She also had the idea that if we buried people standing up, there'd be more room for more plots. <laughs> but since then, she and I have bought plots, <laughs> burial plots. I, t I told, um, I can't remember who, I guess it was Paul and Gail. Uh, we were in, traveling through Dixon together and uh, said, well, we bought land in Dixon. And of course they said, oh no, y'all, y'all leaving. And I said, oh no, no, these are little, little bitty plots of land. Um, but she, uh, but now that we bought those plots, um, being buried standing up doesn't seem quite as appealing. Um, verse 17 provides some important information about the second coming. Those obedient Christians who are alive when the Lord returns will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Paul again mentions we who are alive, but as mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily saying he thought he would be alive. And I, Paul was writing to a group of Thessalonians who were alive at the time of the writing and could have been alive when the Lord returned. But we know now that has not happened. And those Thessalonian Christians did die and are now waiting for the Lord's return. We don't use the word rapture very much in the Church of the Cross, which is not something that's in our everyday vocabulary. And I can understand why it's um, commonly tied to a doctrine that's, that is false. However, if it's used as defined by some dictionaries, which is the act of transporting a person from one sphere of existence to another, for example, from earth to heaven, I can see where there's a place for the word rapture. Um, the rapture is not a secret rapturing of some believers in an invisible coming of Jesus years before his final coming so they can return with him in the clouds. The rapture is a very visible rapturing of all believers at the end of time as they go with him um, back in the heaven. And this passage also discredits the idea that Jesus will have a thousand year reign here on the earth. You will not find anywhere in scripture that Jesus will ever set foot on the earth again. This passage says when he does return to the earth, he will remain in the air, gather his faithful, obedient ones, and return to heaven where they'll be with him always. So what Paul wrote about in this chapter would have been comforting to the Thessalonians who were concerned about their deceased loved ones. Paul assured them that they would not miss out on anything on the second coming. Well, I think that, yeah, that does wrap up chapter four. Any questions before we proceed on? So we close out chapter four and open chapter five. Chapter five is pretty much a continuation of the previous chapter. We talked that, you know, back when Paul wrote these letters, it wasn't divided into chapters and verses. And uh, so as they would have read it, it would just have been a continuation of reading. And although Paul was concerned about the despair the Thessalonians were feeling the gar regarding their loved ones who had died, he was equally concerned, or even more so, about their own understanding of the second coming. You gotta think in the minds of the Thessalonians, if they were anxious about what was to happen to their loved ones who had already died, then what would happen to them if they died before the Lord came again? They didn't wanna miss out on the second coming. They were already concerned that their loved ones were. So Paul, for the most part, leaves the discussion of what is to happen to those who have already passed away and focuses on the when Jesus will return 
and urging them to be ready for that day. That's why I'm read 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware of the day of that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a hammock, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Paul lets them know up front in verse 1 uh, that the times or the epochs or the times and the season, there really wasn't any reason to write about it. Why did Paul say there was no reason to write about that? Yeah, I, there was no use in trying to give them a date. No one knows that date, and they knew it was coming. And um, even Jesus says in Matthew twenty four thirty six, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son of Man, but the Father only. We as finite humans do not need the date and time that Jesus will return. But Paul does describe what it will be like and press them to be ready when he does return. Have you ever thought how bad this world would be if we knew when Jesus was going to return? People would just go nuts. And, um, and then if he was coming back at, at 10 o'clock in the morning, at 9.59, they'd be trying to do a lot of repenting. I don't think that's going to work that way. And... Um, Last minute repentance. Paul tells the Thessalonians in verse 2 that they knew full well, were fully aware of some of the truths of the second coming. Paul had evidently talked about it when he was there earlier. But like a lot of people, when you give someone an answer to a question and they don't like it, they ask again. They may try to frame the question a different way, um, but some people just are not happy with the answer they're given. Children are that way, adults are that way. At a presidential press conference, reporters are that way. Um, but like most parents, even when we are repeatedly asked, we will sometimes offer a full explanation of the answer to the question. Paul continues in his writings that they were fully aware that the day of the Lord would come like a thief in the night, as Dan mentioned. In this phrase, the day of the Lord was used frequently in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord was used a few times to talk about the future destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But the use of day of the Lord is most often used in the New Testament to talk about that final day, the day when the Lord returns again, when both the righteous and unrighteous will be judged. The righteous ushered in the heaven, and the unrighteous being sent to a place of torment. You know, the Thessalonians, they knew that the Lord would turn like a thief in a night at a time when no one expects. And, um, and that's what Lisa was um, alluding to earlier when, you know, you're really not going to know. And since no one except God knows when that day is when the Lord will return, what should we do? Be ready. Always be ready. And um, Howard Marshall, and I'm not sure I know who Howard Marshall is. Some of you may be familiar with him. He mentioned that um, there are preachers who will go to great lengths to trying to determine the date of the second coming. Um, 
They'll create elaborate charts and timelines and use quite a bit of imagination um, to try to determine a date. Many such dates over the centuries have come and gone. The Lord still has not returned. Perhaps they should have preached what Paul taught, and that is the day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. When Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, prophesied that Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people would be taken away in captivity, there were false prophets in those days who started preaching peace. Nothing's going to happen. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Just go on about your lives. Nothing can happen to Jerusalem because this is where the temple of God is. It's where the Ark of the Covenant is. And Jeremiah tried warning the people, but the people refused to listen to the false prophets. And when the Babylonian army attacked Jerusalem and destroyed it, the people were dismayed. They couldn't believe that God's temple had been destroyed and the city walls had been torn down. And God left Jerusalem, but only after the people had thoroughly rejected him. And so today there's false teachers that will tell you everything is okay, you can live your life however you want to. Doesn't matter. Don't worry about the Lord, he's not coming back. And as the people of Jerusalem were caught by surprise many years ago, people today will find themselves surprised when the Lord returns. So when Paul mentions destruction will come upon them here in verse 3, what does this destruction entail? Does it mean to cease to exist? Does it mean annihilation? There's a lot of people that's hoping that you just cease to exist, that there won't be any torment, that there won't be a hell. And, um, but it is a, you will be continued, there will be a continued existence in a state where nothing good happens. Well, we're going to not go any further than that because it gets brought back up again in First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Then Paul uses an analogy that we can all understand, that of a woman going to labor. Sometimes labor pains will start quite unexpectedly when you least expect it. And like unpredictable labor pains, the Lord's return will also be unpredictable. In verse 4, Paul again calls them brothers as he's done so many times. Some 20 times Paul calls them brothers in this first letter. And Paul tells the Thessalonian Christians that they are not in darkness as were the unbelievers who were surprised by the Lord's return or will be surprised. When you read of darkness in the Bible, what does darkness typically represent? Sin, wickedness, that's, or the realm where ugly and ungodly things happen. And because the Thessalonians were not in darkness, that day, the day of the Lord, when he returns, it won't catch them by surprise. I mean, we should always be ready for the Lord's return to happen at any moment. Um, they didn't know the chronological day and time. Um, so why wouldn't the return of the Lord surprise them like the unbelievers of um, chapter 3? Again, it's preparedness. It's being ready. And then returning to the thoughts about darkness being associated with wickedness and light being associated with righteousness. Why is wickedness connected to darkness? What part? How to hide your evil actions, yeah. Generally, people who do something illegal often do it at night when it's easier to evade rest. You can go rob a market at the nighttime, although there's plenty of brazen people that now do it in broad daylight. But, um, but even um, more rebellious sinners engaged in um, drinking, 
immorality, similar vices, tend to do it at night instead of the daytime. Heaven and hell are binary choices. And if you need to take the Lord's Supper, it's available in 205 down 105. I just gave this build on the second floor, Brian. 105 down the hall to your left. <laughs> Heaven and hell are binary choices. All people will go to one place or the other. Saved and unsaved are binary choices. Either you're saved or you're not. You can't be a little bit saved or a little bit lost. Likewise, being in the light and being in the dark are binary choices. One doesn't have to be morally corrupt to be in the darkness. There are many good people, good people, who are in darkness because to be in the light, one must be in Christ Jesus. And there's good people that aren't in Christ Jesus. Paul then tells the Thessalonians in verse 6 not to sleep as the, other do, as the others do, Actually, he phrases it, let us not sleep. In the previous chapter, we talked about those who are asleep or those who had, were already dead physically. Um, in this chapter, he uses the word asleep in a spiritual sense. The others are unbelievers, non-Christians who were spiritually asleep. They are unprepared and will be surprised by the Lord's return. While this you would expect of non-believers, this should not be with the case with those who follow Christ. All right. I thought about what Peter said when he's talking about this very same thing in chapter 3 of 2 Peter. And then you asked, you know, why the believers will not be surprised. You know, Peter said he's talking about the earth being burned up and creation being done away with, basically. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? You know, we're praying for that day to get here. So we won't be surprised because we're expecting it. We're encouraging God to bring it. You know, it should be something that doesn't surprise us. It's what we're living for, really. That's right. I mean, we should... We should look forward and pray for that day to come soon. And um, you're exactly right. Uh, there's things in this life that I would like to see, like to do. Um, but if the Lord came back, even better. <laughs> even better. <laughs> Paul adds to his admon admonition that they should be sober. Um, we usually think of being sober, we associate it with not being drunk, but used in a more general way, being sober also means being in control of one's own senses. You might have a, you might have a translation that has self-control instead of sober, but here, here they mean the same thing. In verse 7, Paul pivots to activities that are littered, to be literally understood most people sleep at night. There's people that work at night that may have to sleep during the day. But generally, people will sleep at night. I do. Um, likewise, people who get drunk generally get drunk at night. Not always. There's exceptions there, too. In chapter 1, Paul tied faith, hope, and love together in his prayers for the Thessalonians. Paul connects these three verses together again in verse 8. First, we're put to put on the breastplate of faith and love. This faith is trusting in God even when things are not going our way. The love mentioned by Paul here is agape love. It's the idea of, of helping others even when we are being mistreated by them. It's the while we were still sinners, Christ died for us kind of love. All right, he has the hope of salvation, and it's the final salvation from sin and the final adoption as sons in heaven. And um, it's a protective piece of equipment just like the breastplate is. God's plan for his people does not include suffering his wrath on the day of judgment. 
God's plan does call for his wrath to be poured out on those who are disobedient. Faithful Christians, however, receive final salvation and adoption as children. Salvation can only be attained through Jesus. And it's through his death that we can receive salvation and our obedience to him. Way back in um, Acts chapter 17, verse 3, Paul preached that Christ had to suffer. He had to die for man's salvation. Because he did suffer and die, we will be able to live with him in heaven. And whenever the Lord comes again, whether we are physically asleep, whether we're dead or awake, physically alive, all Christians will enjoy the benefits of his resurrection. Paul did not know if he would be dead or alive when Jesus returned, and it really didn't matter to him. Either way, he would be brought up in the heaven and live eternally with God. This was just another reminder to the Thessalonians to not worry about their brothers and sisters who had died. They would share in the resurrection. As Paul closes out this section in chapter 5, he instructs them to build one another up. He says they are already doing so, but to do so even more. Everyone can get discouraged at time, and when a brother or sister is discouraged, we should be there to lift them up. In the closing verses of um, 1 Thessalonians, Paul gives them some final instructions and a blessing. So we'll pick up in verse 12. We'll read this scripture, and uh, that pretty much take us to the end of class. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast that what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. In the passage just read, Paul lists several practices the Thessalonians should adopt in their Christian walk. He didn't have to command them. He knew them as brothers. He expected them to do what he was telling them to do. And the first thing Paul asked them to do is to respect or appreciate their leaders. These were men who labored or worked among them. And more than making decisions, these leaders were active, sacrificing their time and themselves. These men were also over you in the Lord. Let's see, I bet I should. Um, these leaders were responsible for giving direction in the congregation. The phrase, in the Lord, uh, makes it clear that Paul's talking about oversight in Jesus' spiritual body, the church. And Paul's final description of these leaders was that they were to admonish or teach them. And it's more than teaching a Bible class, although that would be part of it, but it also includes the thought of counseling or providing guidance. What group of persons in the church are responsible for meeting that description? Elders. And if these leaders were elders, and I believe they must have been, it brings up a question in my mind. Any of y'all got any questions about these guys being elders? First Timothy 3 6 says that elders are not to be recent converts. They must be seasoned Christians, mature in the faith. How long had the Thessalonian church been in existence? Maybe six months? Eight months? Certainly it hadn't been a year since Paul introduced the gospel to the Thessalonians. How could men have matured enough to become qualified to be an elder in such a short period of time? Because today we generally think of several years. 
Um, I'm gonna leave you a cliffhanger. We'll be <laughs> we'll be back to that next week. <laughs> but there's good there's good reasons for that. <laughs>